events. Live broadcast. Good evening. It's six o'clock and it's time to begin. Uh, first of all, well, I want to say welcome. It's delightful to see a full room. And uh, this is the Stillwater League of Women Voters who are uh, sponsoring this forum for our local uh, candidates. And uh, we are so glad you're here. And uh, we want to remind you, first of all, that there is a uh, voter guide available at the library. So go get one if you don't have one already. November 6th is coming right around the corner, very important time for all of us. Uh, these candidates here tonight are uh, here uh, for the Oklahoma House District number 34. That's our district. And in preparation for the election, the Stillwater League of Women Voters are pleased to present this candidates forum. So tonight I'm the moderator. I'm Virginia Bracken Autry with the St Stillwater League. And this evening you're hearing from candidates, first of all, Representative, uh, uh, Republican, excuse me, Aaron Means and Democrat Trish Ranson. Uh, I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves. They each have two minutes, but before we do that, we're going to have a coin toss because after the opening statements, I'm going to read questions that I've received from the audience and the first person will have the, uh, the, the choice of having the first opening statement or the last closing remark. So I'm gonna flip a coin and Trish, why don't you call what I flip? It's Well, it's tails. Okay. Okay, so Aaron, you won that. Uh, so you get either the uh, first opening statement after you do your um, personal introduction. Okay. I have the option. You have two minutes to introduce yourself. But you get the option. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And tell me what your option is. My option would be to have the last. Okay. The, the, last, the, the last. At the end. Thank you. My name is Aaron Means. My name is Aaron Means, and I. And uh, I, I feel blessed to live in this great community. I think this is a God-blessed community. Great people. Um, and uh, I've had the opportunity to serve. Uh, in the military, had opportunity to serve in my church and in general community areas. Um, I'm married to a lovely woman, uh, Sheila Means, who's sitting in the audience, and, and that's another reason why I'm so blessed to the Lord. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be here to, to, present, to present ideas and to help to push things forward in our state. Um, I feel very optimistic about our state and, and the opportunity to serve and, and to help our state move forward. I was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, that's when I joined, joined the uh, United States Public Health Service, and from there also a member of the United States Air Force. Um, and I'm just, just very pleased to be a part of this community. Thank you. Trish, your turn. My name is Trish Ranson. Um, I uh, was the music teacher at Westwood Elementary uh, for the last 15 years. I've lived here with my husband and two children. We've raised them here at Stillwater for 15 years. I grew up in Ponca City um, and decided to move back uh, to help with my folks who were still living in Ponca City at the time, health issues. I was part of the sandwich generation, gladly um, helped out where I could. and. Um, have made a home in Stillwater. And I have discovered that making a home, there's part of it is about blooming where you're planted. And so I've decided that since we are planted here, it's time to bloom. And looking around, seeing a need um, for leadership and a need for representation for our education system, for our citizens who are in need, and decided to make my pitch for representative. Um, so that is what, um, a little bit about me. Uh, I feel 
very honored that the League of Women Voters has put this on and given uh, Dr. Means and I a chance to present ourselves to the voters so that um, you will vote on November 6th. Uh, my name is Trish Ranson and I ask for your vote. Thank you, Trish. I want to introduce, first of all, our timers. Joanne and Ann are here, and they're going to uh, raise the paddles to show our candidates how much time they have left. So that's what they're doing down here. Okay, since he's going to make the last closing statement, or okay. the last, I'm going to give you the first question, and you can respond first. Okay. Okay. The first question from the audience tonight is, the teacher raise was a good start to improving our education. What do you think we need to do next? You're correct. The teacher raise was a good start. Um, however, the teacher raise is not the last what, what the teachers were wanting when they, the walkout occurred. Cuts have been made to the public education system for the last 10 years um, where there were teachers that had class sizes of 16 to 20 ballooned to 24 to 27. Um, the extra bodies that need to be educated, uh, the extra time that needs to grade, the extra time and resources that were not available. And the education system needs help. And so the idea that we need to, we've cut so far, and now we need to see, we need to add funds back into the education system to see where we can go for reform. Thank you. Aaron? We need to have a more robust economy, no question about it. We need to be able to get money in the classrooms. Yes, teachers pay. Yes, technologies in the classroom, smart boards. Yes, we need to be able to have the textbooks for, in the hands of our children, as well as if they are teacher addition, addition textbooks. We need to have broader plans, so not trying to uh, have emergency appropriations only in, in a time of rush, but we really need to take the time to plan, set goals to improve our, improve our economy, improve our classrooms, improve our educational system, and that's from Common Ed, Korea Tech, and higher education. Little people, uh, a few people uh, know that, um, at high, as far as higher ed is concerned, that our educational uh, institutions were in trouble last year or this year. Well, we should never have that again. We have, te we have uh, uh, teachers pulling money out of their own pockets to pay for, to pay for things in the classroom. That should not happen. The, I, the, the, the solution is more money in the, room, in, the, in the classrooms, more money out of the budget coming without any hints of, um, of supplanting of funds. All right, thank you. All right, the next question is on a different subject. Uh, this office was or is held by someone with an uh, admirable record concerning fracking and environmental issues. What is your opinion concerning the 7% seven, the seven gross production tax on oil and gas dollars? I don't believe it's seven now, it's less than that. Mm -hmm. Aaron, you get to answer that yes. first. Well, now it's 5%. All right. So, uh, fracking, fracking. It, it would be good if we can get, if we can actually have a forum. We need to have more communication with with the industry. We need to have us, the constituents, having a better amount, a better degree of understanding of what is happening, uh, what what fracking entails. What alternatives are there to putting the uh, when you take the take the the gas out and then you replace it with uh, with with water? We need to find what are better alternatives to this. One of the things that I'm very concerned about that happens throughout Oklahoma is there seem to be a settling in on whatever that's currently doing, which means settling for the status quo. And in regards to the management of the oil industry, we do need to go beyond the status quo. Let's get the scientists that knows and understanding, let's have research, let's have people come together, let's have forums so that we can better manage the problem that, that we have, especially when it comes to what is the lion's share of our economy. Thank you. Trish? Um, yes, Corey Williams was an advocate for that. and. Um, 
I don't have all of the knowledge that Corey Williams has on the issue. However, I do believe that 7% is uh, a viable option as far as increasing revenue for our state. Uh, there was a recent geological study that had happened that um, tried, was making a correlation between uh, fracking and earthquakes happening far away. And are they are they um, connected? And they tested several states where there is fracking. They could not test Oklahoma because the fracking wells were too close together and in too big of an abundance and number. That tells me, one, we have oil, and two, we're giving it away. So um, I would very much be open to looking at back up to 7%. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question from the audience is, how will you work to support stricter legislation for the possession of guns? Trish, you're first. Okay. Um, gun possession. Right now we, are, we function under federal um, guidelines, and because of the mass numbers of uh, school shootings, I think we need to look at it and see what we can do. However, that's not the only thing that we need to do. We need to look at mental health issues in this state, what drives um, young men, obviously, from the number of school shootings that have happened, to go to that step. How can we intervene, and how can we solve a problem before it becomes a problem? One of the main things we need to really be concerned about when it comes to gun violence is to look at mental health. Look at how we can build community to help our young people at a very young age become more responsible. The more, when we, when we help to this, this strengthen the traditional family value and make our young men more, our children, and we're not going to place it all on, on males, but make people in general more responsible, help them to grow up to be more emotionally and mentally healthy, then I think that's going to be one of the, one of the, the help the solution to adding to decrease gun violence. Also, I think that um, by having more accessibility to, to mental health, um, or, um, mental health agencies and, and, and clinics, I think is another way that people who themselves know that they're in crises uh, can gain help before they go out and commit something that, that is wrong. Um, I'm, a full, I'm fully uh, committed to, to protecting the Second Amendment. We have the right to bear arms. But what we need to do is to help our fellow citizens understand what is being responsible and civil in our society, and that is the key. Helping one another build community so we all can be civil in our, in our great city here, in our state, and in our nation. Thank you, Aaron. Now you have the uh, first uh, opportunity for this next question. Uh, how has your prior experience equipped you to deal with a legislative legislature that cannot get along? <laughs> That's a wonderful question. <laughs> I've supervised over 250 people. I've lived and served in over 10 communities. I've dealt with irate employees and a few irate supervisors. So I've learned to compromise. I've learned to get along. I've learned to work with people. And that is the key. Once again, having a sense of civility within your own self, within your own heart, and projecting it out on others, motivating people to try to get along. And even though we may not be able to see eye to eye 100%, what percentage of you are of your part can you play to bring civility? And how can you help the other person without making them feel degraded, demeaned, and dehumanized so you can help to bring them together? Because we need to be able to have a common goal. And when you project that common goal and you inspire someone to do their best and help the organization, which our organization here is Oklahoma, that's us. When we inspire people legislators or otherwise, to meet the common goal, the best for the people that they want to serve, then I think we'll be able to work together and hopefully work well together. Thank you, Erin. Trish? Well, 15 years as a classroom teacher should be um, ample preparation. Um, I, not only am I a school teacher, I'm a music teacher. And music teachers um, are creative and they think a little bit differently. And um, as I have found out when I talk with other teachers who aren't music teachers. <laughs> but um, the ability to bring multiple people together and um, find what their strengths are, uh, get to know them, and what 
they can add to the the discussion, um, I think is key. And you know, I believe that our life is like a, a musical organization. We're all in together. We're all playing. We're all part of it. Um, everyone counts. We have sometimes someone has the melody. Sometimes someone has the harmony. But we're in it together. And that is the um, premise in which I work, and finding those friends who um, maybe are not reaching their fullest potential to join the organization and to be part of that. So that is pretty much how I approach the classroom. That's how I approach life. And that's how I hope to approach the legislator. Thank you. All right, Trish, you have uh, the first opportunity on this okay. next question. What are the key issues we face in this district, and what are your solutions? The key issues that we face primarily is education. We are a education community. Uh, we are home to one of the top school districts in the state, uh, career tech and higher ed being OSU. Um, so we have the, the, the challenges of how can we maximize our education system here in, in Stillwater um, and make sure that we find ways for everyone to fit in a sort of way. Um, I know that we've had issues with uh, going from common ed to higher ed straight. There we need to look at and what, what career tech can, can do for our kids and retraining even after you um, have lost a job finding another skill set. Uh, career tech and um, early education programs here in Stillwater are nationally national models. So how can we facilitate and use those successes to help out the other issues? So. Thank you. OK, Aaron, what are the key issues we face in this district, and what are your solutions? Yes, education is or the large, when I go to the doors, education is the number one thing that is spoken. And yes, we do need to, once again, it, it all comes down basically to helping to fund our education system. Again, common ed, career tech, and higher education. We need to be able to bring all the resources in so our children can get the best education as possible. But I'd like to add to that also. We have a human tragedy going through our streets as well. and. I have learned from a really good organization called HECO, uh, Limitless is another name for it, that we have people who are human, that are human trafficking through our neighborhoods. Even though we, we may um, live in uh, our homes nice and safely, but there are individuals who, who are going through real trauma. And that's one of them, too. A second one that's going on is, and this is a real big concern of mine, and that is sexual abuse and domestic abuse. These are also really large issues, really large problems that I really want to see solved in our areas. I would love it the day that we'll have none of these things happening in our communities. Education is big. Human trafficking is big. Domestic, domestic violence is big. And sexual assault is also big and those are the issues that really form trauma in our communities thank you Aaron. Aaron, you will uh, have the first opportunity to uh, add, to uh, answer this next question what can our state do to better support our veterans particularly those with mental health issues and severe disabilities our state can better support the the homes our veterans because that's one of the main things that our state does for our veteran veterans another thing is that my wife and I when we, when we lived on McAllister we started a community health center and that's one of the big pushes I want to have as a legislator as also getting to the community and what that can do is that can that can expand health centers around around our state that can have a mental health component and if we can do that two three uh, community health centers around around our uh, state and in, in, in every single county then we'll have more then our veterans will have more access to mental health that is one of the major things that they that they uh, uh, need support of we need support to help to once again to help with homes the, the veterans homes that our state funds and also by by providing community health centers 
We would have health, more health care centers along with the VA, and we can also have, have, uh, have more mental health facilities for them. That way they can access, access those, those facilities and they can better manage the conditions that they are going through. Thank you. All right, Trish, uh, what mm -hmm. support for our veterans, particularly those with mental health issues and severe disabilities? Our state is in a mental health issue crisis, and um, we need to address that. Uh, veterans have a much higher rate of suicide than in Oklahoma than they do in any other state nationwide. We need to be able to have services in which that they can plug into when they return to um, civil our regular society. Um, we need to look at licensing and streamlining a ways in which veterans can uh, use the skills that they learned and used in the military and use them in the in their everyday work life to help get jobs better. Um, and state, yes. So. My father w was a veteran, and he, um, we would often go to the doctor, and it was a veteran doctor, doctor, which was separate from the regular doctor, finding ways to streamline that information process, knowing that uh, what was done at one doctor or the other without having to um, duplicate would be another way to help veterans going back into society. Okay, thank you. All right, the next question, we'll start with you, Trish. Our are there any specific pieces of legislation that you would author if elected? Author if elected, wow. Um, championing children is something that I feel very strongly about. Finding ways in which to protect them, to help them to thrive. Um, finding ways in which for them to be to learn how to be better humans through the arts. Um, I think arts education is a very important thing to have uh, statewide. And uh, both of our children are in marching band. I was obviously a music teacher, so this is something that is um, near and dear to my heart. But focusing on children and their growth and so that that way they grow into strong uh, members of society. Dr. Means. What any, is there any spe, uh, special or specific piece of legislation that you would author if elected? Yes, I want to see the day that the that the governor and the legislature cannot supplant funds from education. There are different funds that are supposed to be going over to education. Uh, we all know about about uh, um, about the about the lottery. That's a good example. What happens is that when monies are coming over to, to, for education, to fund education, to, again, teachers pay, technology in, in the classroom, textbooks, and so forth and so on, money's be coming from, from one resource to help to fund education. So what the government, what the government does is that we'll hold back that same amount of money. Mm -hmm. what, I would want to, what I would want to do, I would want to have legislation that prevent that. So whatever has been set aside to be allocated for education, that comes over. Whatever's gonna come over from the Office of Land Management, that'll come over as well. Whatever's gonna come over from the lottery, that'll come. From all the resources there, they'll come over. And that way, our, our children will have the funding to be educated and our teachers will not have to be pulling money out of their own pockets to pay for supplies that they need in the classroom. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Means, we'll start with you on this question. What type of legislation would you propose for environmental concerns? That's really good, that's really good. Um, what, one of the things that I, I, I like and I've heard it uh, and that, uh, I heard it uh, over the last 10 years or so, is where they're helping, trying to prevent pollution being added to our waterways. Mm -hmm. That's very critical, um, because our waterways are used for, obviously for, for, for drinking, um, obviously, but also for recreation, for, for sporting, and things such as that. So that's, that would be one legislation that, that I would like to, like, to, like to be able to be involved in formulating, helping to prevent pollution of waterways. Trish, what type of legislation would you propose for environmental concerns? Water is key. Um, checking to make sure that the water that is coming into our state is unpolluted. Um, making sure that we have uh, 
energy use of solar and wind energy. Um, that way we are not as dependent upon oil and gas, that it's cleaner burning and it's um, more responsible. I would strongly recommend that we look into that type of environmental energy use as well as um, green spaces. We need green spaces in our communities. It adds to the betterment of our society. It adds, um, it makes folks less stressed and <laughs> I think we need to really look at the amount of green space within a city. Yes, All right. thank, thank you. you. Okay, now this next question, we'll start with Trish. How do you, how do you, we compare with our peer communities in Oklahoma regarding the percent of population in poverty? And what would you propose to improve that, con that condition? How do we compare with our peer communities? Other cities like, um, right. Um, well, it is interesting in the sense that my husband and I were um, traveling out of state and I noticed that as we were driving along the highway we were seeing a lot of Dollar Generals and not many city centers and I was wondering, well I wonder what is the poverty level of this of this city that we're driving through and looked through the census, found the um, zip code and discovered that it was pretty low uh, or the poverty rate was high, excuse me. and. Um, so I thought, well, well, what's Stillwater like? And so I looked through, and I looked through both of our zip codes, 74075 and 74074. And what I found out was that there are two very vastly different poverty levels just within Stillwater. And I think we see that with uh, the presence of our daily bread, the fact that the Food and Resource Center opened up. and thought we would need X amount of people to serve and found out we have actually twice as many people to serve. Um, and poverty is an issue. Um, comparing it to others, really, this is where we live. We need to address the issue here. Dr. Means, how would you compare, how do we compare with uh, our peer communities in Oklahoma regarding the percent of, po of uh, population that live in poverty, and what would you propose to improve that condition? I believe that that question may be relating more so to the various cities in Oklahoma. So let's say we take a look at Tulsa. Let's look at Oklahoma City. When you look at those two cities, the main characteristic and difference between them and us is industry. They have more industry, they have more, their economy is more diverse, is, uh, uh, or, or diversified, I should say. Therefore, what would, be, would help, say, our community when we're talking about still water is once again, bring in what, what it's going to take to promote prosperity. There, in fact, there are three principles that, that, I'll, that all through my whole campaign I've been promoting, life, liberty, and prosperity. So what we would like to do to have more prosperous households, greater income is to bring in more industry here. Things that can complement the industry that we already have. Uh, we can bring in new things that do not compete with the companies that we have here in, uh, in, uh, in Stillwater. So the key is to bring in more prosperity by bringing in more corporate America bringing in, or, or, and also having legislation actually it will help our small businesses as well. Because the more that we help small businesses, the better they will grow. The more we bring in corporate America, the greater the income and actually the, the in, you will increase the number of people employed. And that's the way to help to defeat poverty. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Means, uh, this, this next question is, um, isn't the vast hiring of uncertified people to teach lowering our standard of educational level? Uh, do they use the excuse that administration can't find certified people? Let me approach it this way. When we increase the economic base of Oklahoma, We'll put more money into the coffers, the general fund, more, which means more money into education. More money into education, the better we can hire educated, educated trained teachers. What I mean by that, those who have gotten degrees, bachelors, masters, and PhDs in education. And that will raise what 
I believe the standard with this this particular person uh, is asking about if we keep governing on emergency then one of the things that's going to result is hiring having emergency hires but the greater we can increase and diversify and diversify the economy here in Stillwater the greater the amount of money we'll have for education and the greater that we'll be able to set a target to increase let's say increase educated uh, educated uh, teachers who are educated in the field, say in three years, let's say increase about 25%, say in five years, we should be able to elevate the same percentage up to about 50%. We should have a goal actually to increase uh, those. And the way to do it is through economics, diversifying the economy, bringing money into our economic uh, in, in our educational system. All right, thank you. Trish, is Yes, I heard the question. Okay, good. I would disagree with that. I don't think that a company or other companies are going to come and save the day for us because we do not have the structure to set up for that. The education system right now with the emergency certified teachers, that is because we do not have enough ed students in our higher ed courses to graduate to be teachers, to fill one district, let alone a whole state. That is because we have 10 years of cuts, 10 years of parents and teachers telling students not to go into education. It is a bigger problem than having another company or several companies come in and fix it. We need to look at our education system. We need to recruit people. Yes, emergency certified teachers, we need them right now because we need bodies. But we need people who are trained in this. So if they're emergency certified, let's get them in training so that that way they learn the skills so that they will last longer than three years, which is basically how many years a new teacher is going to last with the workload that they have presently. 27 to 30 students in their classroom, not enough materials, not enough support, not enough time in the day to do everything for that child times 30 that they need. So we need to focus on education. Thank you. All right, Trish, we're going to start with you on this next question. We know that access to quality medical care is critical. Yet rural hospitals are closing and creating GoFundMe campaigns in order to stay open. It is time to, is it time to reconsider accepting federal funds for health care, Medicaid expansion? Yes, I think it is time. We've tried it other ways, the other way, and we have dug ourselves deep. We are not using the billions of dollars that our taxpayer money that is going into the federal government. We're not using those. Our hospitals are closing up. Our rural health care is closing down. Um, we're seeing now where we're having walk-in clinics as opposed to doctor's offices. I mean, there is an issue here. Mental health is, is by far the lowest it, health care is the lowest by far. Mental health issues are the highest by far that we have seen. We need to look at accepting Medicaid expansion, see what that does, get the money into the state. Not only will we be able to improve our care, improve access to care, but we will also be able to create new jobs, which will help our economy as well. Thank you. Dr. Means, did you hear the question? Or would you I did. Okay, I good. Did. Yeah, th right. Thank you. Um, when, when the uh, Affordable Care Act came out and the proposal for expanding uh, Medicare, uh, Medicaid to, to the states, um, what began to happen were, were providers, medical providers were exiting their own practices. And that was a component or part of what happened, unfortunately, to, to hospitals, um, rural hospitals. But I do propose being able to set up grants, the state set up grants to help to see federally qualified community health centers. And that way we can actually have more centers, health care uh, agencies, facilities around the state. And each of them can actually even, hopefully be able to design to have them where they would be, where they would be um, mental health components. So by increasing the number of facilities, we'll be able to take care of the number of people who are seeking that type of service, medical service, 
that do not have the funds, to, the monies to, to go to the typical, the typical clinics. Um, Federally qualified community health centers is a very good option. It's a very, it's, an, it's actually an outstanding option, particularly if they have a mental health component. And I think that's, a, that's an excellent solution to help solve the problems in underserved areas. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to start with you for the next question. What about vulnerable older Oklahomans? The for-profit nursing home associations continue to attempt to weaken legislation that erodes regulation, especially for vulnerable older adults who reside in long-term care facilities. What will you do to keep this, these regulations in place and even strengthen them? I think one of the key things to do would be to ensure that we have inspections to all facilities. Also, a legislator take for instance here in Stillwater, should make themselves available to hear the issues of their constituents. Not just by telephone or remote by TV or radio or anything like that, but be personally. And that's one of the things I'm pledging to do. And I don't do many pledges. That's one thing I really pledge to do, to be available in different areas around the district to sit down and to listen. Because if a legislator is available to listen, someone's going to come and say, this particular facility is subpar, substandard. What can be done? And then what will happen, go back to the Office of Public Safety that's in the Capitol, begin the research what statutes are on the books already, and then go set into action to correct whatever problem that's going on in the district. All right, thank you. All right, Dr. Means, we're going it's to my turn. Oh, is it your turn? <laughs> <laughs> losing, losing track here. I'll, 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 so I'll take another right question. I'm fine. <laughs> okay, this one starts with change takes money. I didn't get to answer the question. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, would you like for me to repeat it? For, Please. For, my, yes. for myself. That would be wonderful. Uh, what about vulnerable older adults? The for-profit nursing home associations continue to attempt to weaken legislation that erodes regulations, especially for vulnerable older adults who reside in long-term care facilities. What will you do to keep this re the regulations in place and even strengthen them? Regulations are there for the, the protection of the people. And the elderly, um, is, from this question, I'm assuming are not able to help themselves. Uh, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and uh, about 12 years ago, she lived with it for nine years. Her last year of her life was in hospice care within the nursing home. And the hospice care had the extra benefit of checking in on her. Um, my father was living in an assisted living in the same location but on the other side of the building towards the last three years, two years to three years of her life, he decided to reside in the same room as she so that he would be an extra advocate for her. She could not speak, she could not communicate. And it's a real issue because the nursing homes, there are many that are there that do not have family to look after them. That is something that because of my experience there, I will be mindful of it because our elderly need our care. They worked to make our country great. They made it life better for us, and we should return the favor to them. Thank you. All right, we'll start with you on yes. this one, and hopefully I'll get both of you. Okay. <laughs> uh, this one starts out with change takes money. What are some new revenue uh, sources the state legislature can explore? Well, I think as far, you're right, change does take money, and um, we have cut things back so very much on all of our core services, uh, education included, that we need to, um, to look at what our options are there. Um, I think everything should be on the table. Uh, we have, you know, the mentioned be earlier, the 7% uh, GPT, returning that up. Uh, looking at possibly repealing the capital gains exemption tax, um, checking to um, in accepting Medicaid so that that way we have federal dollars coming into our state, and then looking around and deciding, okay, what can we spend our money on smarter? What things are our priorities in our state? 
what can we use that money for um, to better our society? Looking at criminal justice reform, looking at how can we do intervention, how can we um, do alternate sentencing for nonviolent offenders, um, how can we do drug treatment or preventive medicine instead of illness um, or diagnosis treatment and um, using our money more wisely. Um, I think that there are a whole host of things that we can do. It's going to take 101 <laughs> legislators to get together and see what is going to be the best, but um, that is something that we need to look at all angles for. Thank you. Dr. Means, what new revenue sources uh, can the state legislature explore? The state legislature legislature essentially used two different types of uh, revenue taxes or 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 expansion of 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 of, of, uh, of revenue in, in regards to corporate corporations and I do believe the very best way of raising taxes is increasing employment the best way, also the best way of raising taxes is by expanding the economy, diversifying the economy, because that way you bring more corporation in, you'll get more corporate tax. Finding ways to increase, lift people up and outward for prosperity, I believe, is the, is the greatest way of getting more revenue. One of the things that I firmly believe that when you come to personal income tax, when it comes to existing corporations, existing small businesses, we need to take a very intellectual approach when we start thinking about taxing the existing, the existing um, um, sources, where up or down need to first have impact studies to see what the impact will be on the, on the community at the present, but in diversifying the economy, I think, is the best way. Well, this next question uh, uh, addresses addresses that same uh, source uh, or lack of source. <laughs> All right, I'm going to read it to you first. You're the first to respond to this. Okay. Several states have legalized recreational marijuana and have realized abundant state revenues, an average of 25 percent reduction of and a re average reduction of 25% uh, of opiate use. What is your position in legalizing recreational marijuana to help our state? I Two once days. heard, <laughs> <laughs> I once heard our current legislator uh, for our district uh, say in the open forum that recreational marijuana and um, medical marijuana were essentially the same thing. I'm a, I'm a provider. I'm a health care provider, and when I would write prescriptions for, for um, Schedule II medications, those medications were written on, in prescription form with my signature, and it was taken to a pharmacy for distribution. In regards to recreational marijuana, I am very concerned. I, I'm not willing to improve my educational system if I, if I believe that people are going to be smoking marijuana and will tax it because I know it's going to get into the hands of our children. Will it help our children complete high school? Will it help us to reduce intoxicated individuals behind the wheel? Will, it help, will, will smoking marijuana really help us to produce the type of workers that we want in our, in our, in our factories and in our, in our, uh, for employment? when we try to track corporations and we are not able to produce the type of workers, employees, employees that they need because unfortunately that they, they use recreational marijuana, they're driving on the streets with us and our children walking around. It's Thank you. maybe an issue. All right, Trish. All right, don't have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long question. Yeah. Um, I'm neither for it or against it. Um, I'm still kind of waiting to see how I feel about it. Honestly, medical marijuana has passed. Um, I, it's my understanding that uh, there were enough signatures uh, 
enough signatures acquired to put uh, recreational marijuana on the next ballot, but missed the deadline. Um, so there's obviously people out in our state who are interested. Um, we are slow movers, and that's, that's two really big changes all at once. Um, I say, let's look at mar medical marijuana. Let's find out how this works. Um, I will say that the states that have accepted medical marijuana, their next step was recreational marijuana as well. So that looks like that could be on our horizon. Um, how we deal with that is going to be uh, based on our values and how we come together and compromise. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with you, Trish, on this next question. How will you support and fund our schools to ensure the safety of our children, teachers, and their staff? So school safety is a really big issue. Um, and I will tell you as a teacher, um, having to take children through drills of lockdown and what it to take 20 some kids and ask them to be in a dark corner and hide um, is heart wrenching an experience. Then we had an incident a couple of years ago at Westwood where we had to evacuate and evacuating 565 children plus staff um, in a short and timely manner was very stressful to say the least. We need to fund it. It is presently not funded and that's one of the multiple unfunded mandates that are put on our schools. We need to make it a priority. Um, Coach Gundy had helped with us at the end of the year last year with um, sheriffs at each of the sites and that really did help. But our school resource officer program has been cut multiple times over the years. And so we are sharing officers between schools. We need to have someone at each school and we need to make sure that that is funded. Thank you. Erin, how will you support and fund uh, our schools to ensure safety of our children, teachers, and their staff? Funding, once again, should start with our state, the government responsibility. To help the government do a better job, once again, I go back to diversifying our economy. But also, I, I, I invite everybody to take a look at my Facebook page, my political Facebook page, Aaron Means for House Seat, because I had an interview with the Christian radio station. And while we are waiting for our state government to step up and be able to put the funds in there to, to provide for safety, I recommended that we can also partner with the community, partner with our school systems. I have, I have a proposal that's on that Facebook page, it's a video, where we can have a two-door system. First door with, a, with, a, uh, with some type of monitoring device for, for metals. The second door, like at, at uh, say, Skyline and many other schools, where it's locked. And where the system, the two-door system, can, one can alarm the office, the second one can be, can be locked uh, to make it, make it a little shorter. I believe that, one, number one, our state needs to fund it. Number two, though, in the process, I think we can gather, come together as a community and begin to partner with our schools because it should be a priority. These are our treasures, and we do need to help them make them safe along with the staff that, that educate them. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Means, we're going to start with you with this next question. Uh, with our state being in the top 10 with the most cases each year for the traumatic brain injury, what will you do to help those living with traumatic brain injury re-enter the community? Great question. And number one, we go, have to go right back to being able to, to have appropriations for the different needs around our state. I can't overemphasize that. We have to have the funds to be able to put into, into mental health and to, to those with disabilities to, to basic uh, health issues. Once again, the best way of increasing the funds to go into our general fund is to diversify, is to have more invite corporations to come into the state, have more tax collections, and then once we do that, have experts experts, in this case, traumatic brain injury, to be able to give recommendations. Number one, for prevention. Research what is the main cause, even the top three main causes. Then make recommendations how those, those issues can be, can be avoided. Two, what are, again, relying on experts. 
What does it take to help them maintain or regain a good quality of life? Everything has to be done in a very intellectual way. We can, we can once again, get back into partnership with the community, with the state, and with those who have traumatic brain injury to begin to form solutions. And solutions mainly can be bought once you begin to form panels to come together and intellectually engage the problem, identify the problem, find some possible solutions, select the solutions, activate the solution, and then evaluate what you've done. Thank you. Uh, uh, still my question. Okay. <laughs> I'll take another question. What, what can I do about <laughs> TBI? Yeah. Yes, TBI. it is an issue, top 10. That's, it's another top 10 we do not want to be in. Um, identifying the problem, researching how the, the causes, are there safety precautions that we can take within a society to help alleviate those. Um, addressing the needs of those with TBI, um, what is it that they are needing medical treatment, are they needing um, as far as job training or doing um, whatever process through the from diagnosis through treatment do they need to reintroduce into society and to engage them the the folks they're part of our society and we represent okay. everyone and we need to make sure that we are looking at solutions to help all of our citizens thank you you're just in time for the next one oh great thank <laughs> you <laughs> okay what a what are your positions on the state question 793 uh, which is the vision care the vision care mm -hmm. um, I do not like the state question 793 simply because of the language that gives corporate uh, oversight over uh, the eye doctor um, I think that the way it is a way to try to get more access to eye care um, I don't like the idea that um, the eye doctors could be put on a quota of you need to prescribe 10 eyeglasses a day, um, whether or not they have patients that need them. Um, I think that there can be other reforms, there can be other ways of going at increasing access to eye care uh, for our citizens, a better way than changing our constitution. Thank you. Dr. Means, this is the Vision Care Eyeglass uh, State Question 793. What is your position on that? I, I agree. I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a supporter of it. And the main reason is right about two-thirds down the, down the, uh, the write-up on, on that question, uh, there's an area that concerns me. It suggests that the store has the, retains the ability to influence how much time uh, they may spend with a patient, with their patient, or uh, what type of screenings that can be performed uh, on the patient, which means the potential, I'm not saying it is, but the potential for compromising the health of the patient. A patient goes to any type of doctor, and the, the biggest expectation is that I'm going to get the best service coming here like I would at another place. And so the language, once again, uh, it, 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 it was spot on. The language itself suggests that uh, the store may control that. And so the issue would be they go to a store, they rush through their appointment, and then what might happen is some type of diagnosis may be missed. Some type of condition may not be caught. And so the patient goes home thinking that they have a great service and potentially develop some type of medical condition of the eye that wasn't picked up uh, because it would rush through. Thank you. Uh, we are down to uh, only one minute uh, left within our time, so we don't have time for both uh, candidates to answer the question. So this does end the uh, uh, time with the forum with these two candidates for uh, State House uh, District uh, 34. I would remind you that uh, we, the voters, are the ones who make the call. So November 6th is coming up. Early voting starts uh, November 1 and 2. Go vote. Let your voice be heard. Thank you.
personal airport and uh, kind of like a dream come true really. Fortunately, our uh, business is just two miles away from here. We brought in a number of dealers from around the country for some training and, and events here in Stillwater and we had them all fly into Stillwater and we picked them up right here and took them straight to the company because it's mid-afternoon. So within 10-15 minutes, they're here. There's no really travel involved, no having to find the car and, and all these uh, hassles. I just can't uh, think of any reason that a lot of people wouldn't begin using this and I think it's going to build as people realize how easy it is to use. Today we're going to be talking about the curbside recycling program. I'm here with Matt Faulkner. He is a part of our waste management team and he's going to give us an overview of curbside recycling. So what is it, Matt? What can I put in my cart? Great question. The most common recyclables are cardboard. This is the type of cardboard. It's paperboard, aluminum cans, newspaper, and tin cans. Those are the most common types of recycling you'll find. When it does come to plastic, there is a little bit of confusion. Why is it confusing? Well, I'll show you. So the acceptable recycling plastics that we take are plastics ones, twos, and fives. To find that on any of the recyclables that we take, there'll be a label on there that says one, two, or five. I have circled that to make it a little easier. Yeah, that is easy. It's not going to be circled when I. It will not be circled when you get to your house. With your number two, you'll mostly encounter plastic jugs with milk jugs or detergent bottles. And you can usually find these on the bottom. They are sometimes hard to identify. Mm -hmm. The writing can be small and hard to read. You do sometimes have to put a little effort to it. Um, with plastic number fives, um, one of the most common number fives that you will find here in Stillwater, these cups. Uh, okay. I think we all pretty much have one <laughs> and they're marked on the bottom. They are a number five. Um, flower pots are generally a five and they're marked on the bottom. And another very common number five is pill bottles. Fortunately for most of the recyclables that you accept, especially the plastics, ones, twos, and fives, they are most commonly the most labeled recyclable plastic you can find. But you'll have some that you just, I don't know what this is, yeah. it feels plastic, but I don't see a number. Water hoses are a great example, they feel plasticky, yeah. but they're just a high compressed rubber. So if you are in doubt and you do not see a number, it's better just to go ahead and throw that out than it would be to con risk contaminating the load. Okay, thank you so much for your time, Matt. Thank you. All right, and then if you have any questions about recycling, you can go to the website, stillwater.org, or you can call our customer service department. When your power goes out, the city of Stillwater doesn't want you to be left in the dark. If you have access to a computer or smartphone, you're now able to report your power outage online via stillwater.org. Once you've reached the home page under the online services menu, click report power outage. Now you're just a few steps away from letting our electric utility team know about your outage. Click report outage, enter your name, and either your account number or the phone number linked to your account. Click the call back box if you'd like to receive a phone call when your power is restored. View the outage map to see what other areas of town are having power issues. You may find that your entire neighborhood is out of power. This information is just as beneficial to you as it is to I'll you. give you my water. I have a water. Seriously, I've got two waters. They didn't bring extra cups. Go ahead. We're going to start, uh, my phone's not on, uh, my phone.
We're going to start here pretty quickly. We're ready to start. Your mics, is that what you said? Okay, I have a time. It's time to start. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome to the uh, Stillwater League of Women Voters campaign uh, forum. This is for uh, our state and local offices. Uh, first of all, I want to remind you uh, November 6th is coming up quickly. Be sure you are ready to vote. If you do not already have one of these, go to the library. They're free. They're uh, voter guides. They address the state questions. Tonight you're going to hear for candidates uh, for uh, district attorney for Oklahoma District 9. Uh, I'm the moderator, Virginia Bracken Autry, uh, with the Stillwater League. And uh, you're going to be hearing from uh, Laura Thomas, uh, Republican, and Corey Williams, Democrat. Uh, we're go they're going to be making an op opening statement here quickly, but first of all, we're going to have a coin toss. Uh, Laura, I'm going to ask you to call it. Okay. Heads. It came up tails. Okay. The winner of the, uh, that would be Corey, because you called tails. The winner uh, will do either the first opening statement or give the last closing remarks. That's your choice. You get to pick which one you want. I'll give the closing remarks. You'll do the closing remarks. Okay. Remind me to do the closing remarks. We got so busy with questions last time we didn't get around to the closing remarks. Okay. Now I'm going to give each candidate uh, two minutes to, first of all, just to give them a personal introduction. So, Laura, we're going to start with you. I'm Laura Thomas. I am your elected DA. I've been a prosecutor for 34 years and your elected DA for the past four. I was elected after the seat came open for almost the first time in 40 years. Um, I worked under Rob Hudson. I worked with Tom Lee and then made the decision to run for re-election when, when Tom did not decide to run for re-election. It's all about experience for us. We live in a world with complex and constant crime. We're living in a community where mental health needs aren't addressed, where education needs aren't addressed, where job needs aren't addressed, and where crime needs aren't addressed. None of these agencies, none of our partners in criminal justice receive money. As in education, district attorneys have taken a cut for the past 10 years, consistent cuts. Um, that leaves us prioritizing who we employ. Um, and tough times call for tough measures. This district is one of a few that do not have an investigator. Fortunately, I have exceptional law enforcement agencies to work with who continue to um, investigate crimes for us even after they per present them to us. Um, one of the things that are, we are looking at right now, we have an overwhelming amount of domestic violence, domestic violence including strangulation. Our legislature considers these nonviolent crimes. There's a number of crimes that the legislature feels are nonviolent. My opponent feels nonviolent crimes should not be ever incarcerated. Um, that includes burglary too, indecent exposure, domestic abuse by strangulation, peeping Tom, um, cattle rustling into the millions, and we've had multiple citizens who've suffered, lost nearly their entire livelihoods from something they've built up their entire lives. I think that deserves incarceration. I forgot uh, early on to introduce our timekeepers, uh, Joanne and Ann, and they're giving the signals for the uh, time left. So I apologize for that. All right, Corey, your introduction. Thank you. My name is Corey Williams. I've been the state representative for most of Stillwater for the last 10 years. I've uh, been an attorney for 12 years. Um, have my own law office here in Stillwater and a uh, property management company and, a prop and uh, development. We've done uh, seven buildings in downtown Stillwater, and then we manage about 400 units now. Um, I ran in part in 2008 on a platform of criminal justice reform. 
I don't think we do it right in Oklahoma. We are a huge outlier, number one uh, in the nation for incarceration, and we lead the free world uh, in that. That means that anytime you cross our border, we either have inherently worse people or we have a flawed criminal justice system. And having met a lot of people on the doors, I happen to believe the latter. And we get close to passing criminal justice reform. We had a Republican governor who made it a, a priority for her over her last four years. She just didn't have the political capital to get across the finish line. Everything that we've passed has been watered down by one entity, and that's the District Attorney's Council. So that's one of the reasons that I am running. I want to bring um, fairness and justice uh, and the pursuit of topics that truly are important um, back to our courthouse. And I would appreciate it if we spoke for each other because I've never once said that I wouldn't ask for incarceration on crimes like that. Domestic violence with strangulation? You quote me somewhere where I've said that. Corey, you said it at the last forum. Wait, wait a minute. No, no ma'am, I did not. Okay. And I have the audio of that entire thing. Me, me too. Okay. All right. We're going to start with the, uh, the, the questions, and uh, they will have separate uh, answers. And uh, uh, Laura, we're going to start with you. What is your position on state question 794, also known as Marcy's Law? I'm a supporter of Marcy's Law. I've been a supporter of Marcy's Law since they first came into the state. What Marcy's Law attempts to do is to elevate victims' rights from just a statutory level to a constitutional level, a much more higher level of protection than they currently have. Marcy's Law, we, Oklahoma already had a Crime Victims' Bill of Rights that Senator Brooks Douglas was responsible for creating and enacting after his family was murdered and his sister was raped and he survived. Um, he left us with that bill in approximately 1992. It allows victims to speak at certain hearings, not at other hearings. It allows some notifications, not other notifications. Um, it allows them to not uh, say from the witness stand when they're having a victim impact statement what they want the punishment to be. They're not allowed to say that anymore by case law. I don't think there's two, two parties to a criminal trial. There's the state of Oklahoma, the people they represent, and the defendant. They're both entitled to rights. There is no reason that the people of the state who are the victims have less rights than a criminal who's harmed them. So I've always supported um, victims' rights. My opponent voted against victims' rights in the legislature, and I feel like they're imperative. That's what I do as a district attorney. We prosecute criminal offenders. We advocate for victims. Those are my statutory duties. Thank you. Corey, what is your position on the state question also known as Marcy's Law? And repeatedly I've said that I have a, a position of ambivalence towards Marcy's Law. Um, if you've ever read the state constitution, you know that it is a long, cumbersome document. Uh, recently, we pulled our alcohol reforms out of the constitution because anytime you want to change something that is in the constitution, it requires a vote of the people. In the 10 years that I've been in the legislature, I've seen us pass well-intentioned laws that have unintended consequences, and we have to go back in and fix those a year or two years later. And you can do that pretty easily through the legislative process. You cannot do that very easily with a vote of the people. That being said, Marcy's Law, the language, it's fine. We do have a Victim's Bill of Rights already in statute. What we have is a bunch of DAs who don't pay any attention to it. And you're going to have the same thing with Marcy's Law passes. A lazy, disengaged DA will give the same rights and the same civic engagement to a victim that they're already giving. Marcy's Law doesn't actually require a DA to do anything until the victim actually asks for it. How many of you read the Constitution? How many victims do you think have? My guess is, not that many. A lazy, disengaged DA will still not communicate with a victim. And an engaged and concerned DA will. Thank you. Corey, we're going to start with you on this next question. Uh, if time constraints and core obligations allow, what would you like to accomplish in the next four years? I'd love to see a women in recovery program here, a diversionary uh, program for women. We know by using empirical data that if we pull a woman out of a home and send her to DOC custody, we have almost guaranteed that that household uh, will come into contact with the criminal justice system. We've almost guaranteed cyclical poverty. 
we should absolutely have a women in recovery program here. It was what, three years ago, Laura, that I brought women in recovery from Tulsa here to meet with our DA because I thought there was a perfect synergy between a woman DA and a billionaire philanthropist who wants to help women stay out of custody. That conversation fell flat. We're gonna restart it. I also wanna bring them in a mental health court. I know that there's been a uh, misdemeanor drug program, at least in the works. Uh, it's gonna have to be expanded for some of the things that we have going. I wanna go paperless in our office so that we can respond quicker, so that we can have less people in pretrial custody and we can communicate with our defense lawyers. And I want to start an open door policy, not only with defense lawyers, but with our law enforcement. There needs to be a running, regular interval conversation. If you go around and talk to most law enforcement right now, that conversation, it's not happening. They need to be in the same room so we're all on the same page because an efficient law enforcement agency protects public safety. And I know what needs to be in the reports and we should be able to communicate that with them. And right now, that communication just isn't happening. Thank you. Uh, Laura, would you like for me to repeat the question? No, I've got it. Okay. Um, one of my dreams, if time permits, the first 17 months of my term was taken up with the Adacia Chambers case, the Isaiah Marion beheading murder, and 13 other homicides that happened in 2015. And when that was done, one of the things we did was myself, Debbie Vincent, one of my attorneys, Dee Miller, who's with Community Sentencing, and Dr. Linda Evans, who's a psychologist in private practice and in the jail, we went to um, Women in Recovery, the program in Tulsa. Um, we met with them for an entire day. They shared the curriculum with us. They cannot fund us. They will not fund us. And so what's been, uh, we have the partners to do it, but for a women's program to be viable, it has to be a live-in program because they come from backgrounds they cannot go back to or the same behaviors will happen. Um, one of those ways, and what we've been looking for for the past year, is a person wealthy enough or own land or structures enough that would be interested and willing to do this. And we just found uh, someone who's become a friend of mine that has 140 acres with structures on it. So we're very excited about that. That's what I will do. Law enforcement are in my office on a daily basis. Law enforcement has a code to our doors, so they come in. They're in our office eight hours a day with us. We don't reserve a day for them. They come in. Thank you. All right, Laura, we're going to start with you on this next question. Historically, uh, county attorneys do not readily pursue cases involving abuse, neglect, and exploitation of older adults. Why is this so? And what will your approach be to, ch to change such cases? Well, that is not correct. Um, our office has made um, adult protective services, financial exploitation of the elderly, physical abuse of the elderly by in-home peoples or by caretakers a priority. One of the problems with um, crimes against the elderly is it's almost equivalent to a crime against the child. They're largely unreported. I mean, children have more agencies that speak for them than the elderly have. Um, the elderly are... Are, I was just incredibly close to my parents, so if I wasn't in this field, I would be in some kind of elder care. But we have prosecuted multiple and incarcerated multiple people who have stolen the life savings of the elderly that needed care. So they were left with no care after their uh, lifeblood was stolen. That happens frequently in our office, the prosecution of those offenders. We've prosecuted from nursing homes, uh, caretakers who have who have harmed disabled individuals in group homes and who have harmed people in our nursing homes. Um, that's something that's been going on for quite a few years in, in almost every place in the state. Thank you. Corey? I think it's a couple of, of different issues. First off, it, it's not sexy. It's not drugs. It's not alcohol. It's not the thing that we have pursued for the last two or three decades that makes the headlines. It's um, a, a simmering sore uh, underneath the, the skin of society, but it doesn't mean that it isn't worth pursuing. Um, the second off, we don't have a DA investigator in our county. We're one of the few counties in the state that doesn't have one. Pot County has five. We don't have anybody to help make that case. And we need people to help make that case. 
so that the prosecutors can take it into court and be efficient and be effective. Thank you. All right, this next one, we're gonna start with Corey. If you were elected to fill the position of district attorney, how would you address laws uh, of helping people with historic, with histories of trauma uh, in, in, the, uh, in the following areas of the law? It says, it says, historically, Payne County has been behind the trend in trauma-informed care for children in court. What essential components of trauma-informed ju judicial practice do you feel are most important, and how would you plan to improve care for children in court? Paragraph of a question. Oh, it's typed out. Well played. Uh, you have to use, utilize all of the collaborative partners in a situation like that with the Seville Center and, and the investigators and, and the police, and you want to minimize absolutely the trauma that a child has to go through whenever recounting their story. Um, I'm not 100% sure I understood by the end of the question what exactly we were, we were getting to. Uh, I think it's a poorly written question. I'm going to drop it, and we're going to go on to another question. So we're going to start with you again, Corey. What is your experience trying jury trials, and what is your experience influencing jurors? All right. This one is always specifically tailored for me, so whoever wrote it, I appreciate it. <laughs> Do anybody want to raise their hand? No? I have a sneaking suspicion. None. Okay. And if I'm DA, I probably won't be in the courtroom trying the case either. And Henry Ford wasn't on the line building the widget. You're not hiring your chief trial officer. You don't see her sitting first chair most of the time. Name a case that you've seen her actually go in and argue the clothes on. Tom Lee, didn't do it either. Rob Hudson, neither. We're the CEO of a law enforcement agency. You're hiring me to make it more efficient. You're hiring me to make it fair. You're hiring me to communicate well with you. For 10 years, I've answered every single constituent's concern and question. I've advocated for people on both sides of the aisle, no matter whether they voted for me or not. You're hiring me to be just and fair and pursue the public priorities. I've been a Democrat elected in a Republican seat for 10 years, eight of which I have not had an opponent. The reason is I communicate well with people, and I respect them, and I do the bidding of the people and the will of the people. When it came to criminal justice reform in 780 and 781, I was right there with it, trying to help get it over the line. She was writing an op-ed against it. That's it. Thank you. Laura? The district attorney is different than a position of part-time legislature. It requires that the DA perform certain duties. One is the prosecution of criminal offenders. The other is uh, advocation of victims' rights. There's some other ones in there too, such as um, civil representation for county officials. We are their legal advisor. And there's a few other ones. Um, you don't learn how to be a prosecutor by being elected to the job. It requires experience. It requires starting at the bottom and working your way up to try in all types of crowds, including death penalty homicide cases. I have been the attorney who received only the second death penalty given in Payne County ever. It is not something you learn by, by handling 54 misdemeanors and 15 felonies circling around DUIs and drug offenders. That does not prosecutor make. I am the one who trains my prosecutors based on the experience I have had for the past 34 years. I am the one that mentors them, helps them, and advises them. I am the one that takes the lead on some of our most convoluted and complex cases in our district. I have tried dozens and dozens and dozens of jury trials. And you need your chief law enforcement officer of the district needs to be a leader. You cannot be a leader unless you have followed. Thank you. All right, Laura, we're going to start with you on this, last, this next question. What are nonviolent crimes and uh, what position of a pr is appropriate sentence for punishment for these offenders? What are nonviolent crimes and your position of appropriate sentencing for punishment of these uh, offenders? 
nonviolent crimes or any crime that's not on a list that the legislature enacted that said they're violent. The problem with this is when people talk about criminal justice reform or that people are incarcerated on nonviolent offenses, they don't know what the term nonviolent encompasses. It encompasses burglary in the second degree. And if you've ever come home and your house has been wiped clean, you feel pretty violated. Um, it includes indecent exposure. And when you're driving down the street or your daughter is and the guy next to her is exposing himself repeatedly, that's a nonviolent crime. Domestic abuse by strangulation, domestic abuse at all, nonviolent crimes. Each has to be handled separately. Each offender has to be handled separately because each offender has a different background and some different needs. But those offenders, those offenders are deserving of time to do. Corey? Thank you. I don't think we disagree on that. Um, you know, the legislature does some weird things and we label things um, with some weird labels. You know, 3.2 beer was considered a non-intoxicating beverage for a very long time. But I think you can ask almost any OSU student whether or not they can get intoxicated on it and they'll probably say, yeah, absolutely. And so, um, I mean, a non-violent offense is any offense that isn't listed on this. Um, well, this, goes, this appendix goes to PP. So, I mean, there's a whole lot uh, of nonviolent offenses that certainly deserve jail time. Uh, but there's also a lot of nonviolent offenses that deserve redirection and community-based sentencing. And we have been using the hammer over the head approach of incarceration for decades. And we're just not getting anywhere. And so we should be looking at alternatives for those people. All right, this next question, we're gonna start with Corey. How does the public measure the performance of a DA? We had this uh, question earlier today, and, and um, my response then was, I think by the promises you make and the promises you keep. And um, I don't think that you can uh, use a metric of um, you know, the number of prosecutions or the conviction rate. We've tried to use those metrics. In fact, that's one of the reasons that we got to the point that we're at, is for years, both from the federal and from the state side, you were rewarded for having a high conviction rate. Uh, and it's resulted in the, in the problem that we've had. For me, it's have our public safety numbers improved? Because while we're number one in incarceration, we're not doing that great in public safety. Is my community safer? Have we been able to lower the rate of violent incident in my community? Have I done the things that I said I was going to do? Have I been transparent? Have I been easy to access? Have we launched the Women in Recovery program? Have I created other diversionary places for defendants to go? Have I expedited the process of criminal justice so that people that are legally innocent are getting before the court and getting their redress and either found guilty or going through the system or getting kicked out? Those are the things I think would be uh, considered uh, success and a good metric of which to me measure by. Thank you. Laura? I do think you can judge DA's offices in several different ways that are all important. One of the things is how you administer your budget. Are, are you doing it correctly? Are you doing it within state law um, and county? Purchasing Act also. And we do a lot of that daily with the auditor's office, but the auditors also audit all state agencies every two years, or they're supposed to. Ours has been audited every two years and starts again next week, and I don't understand how some agencies like the Department of Health never got audited. Um, you can't judge a DA by their conviction rate, and I'll say this again. If you have a DA that wins every case that they take into the courtroom, you have a DA that's not filing cases that need to be filed filed because we file difficult cases. We file cases that people disagree with all the time. That's the nature of our system. That's the nature of what a jury does. Um, we have diversion programs and when you talk about incarceration rates, you need to look at Payne and Logan County because we don't have the highest incarceration rates. We have people, judges using PR bonds every single day on offenders in jail for felonies and misdemeanors. We have people that earn their way to prison in our district because the judges give them so many chances in drug court, in um, diversion G truancy court, in juvenile court. Um, two, three, four chances because we don't want them to go to prison because there's not any real programs in prison. Thank you. 
All right, uh, this next question, we're going to start with you, Laura. What experience do you have managing a large budget, large staff, and maintaining good mo morale among your staff? The District 9 is the ninth largest district attorney's district in Oklahoma, almost the eighth. We're moving up. Um, I have the same staff, though, that we had basically through Rob Hudson and through Tom Lee, around 40, 45. I do hire a lot of part-time staff, including some attorneys that chose to go part-time, such as Tom Lee is back working for me now part-time and reviewing charges daily. Um, what we do is um, busy. We're, we're busy work, um, and we... Uh, do that by having qualified and trained staff to to do to work hard to go to trainings to be recognized for their successes in the field that they've um, because we're very specialized now you have to become specialized when you're dealing with specialized child cases specialized financial cases we have accountants on board as attorneys we have domestic abuse forensic interviewers um, attorneys on board uh, you just proceed through it very carefully and very fairly. Thank you. Corey? Well, budget-wise, I've worked on about a $7.2 billion budget for the last 10 years. So I've got a little bit of experience in managing competing interests, uh, not only from uh, two different sides of the aisle, but it doesn't matter what side of the aisle an agency head comes from. They are the most important person, and their agency is the most important agency. And if they don't get the money that they need to be appropriated, everybody will shrivel up and die. Oh, for 10 years, that has been the story every April. So I've done a lot of complex budgeting. We have five employees in my office. Um, I've provided health care for them. I've, uh, in the lean times, written personal checks, and in the good times, uh, was able to pay bonuses. So I have no problem doing that. My assistant that left in December had been there for seven years, and she did the only thing that I couldn't compete with, and that was going back to Leedy, Oklahoma, to be with her family. Um, I, could, I couldn't give her money to stay in a situation like that. Um, you know, I, I don't think I have any problem managing people at all. I haven't had turnover in my office. We've had a lot of turnover at the DA's office, 13 assistant DAs. Half the time, I have no idea who I'm supposed to reach out to to deal with my case. A lot of us have that problem. It ends up causing delays in the process. All right, the next question, uh, Corey, we're going to start with you. Can changes in, the, in this state result from what a county DA decides to not prosecute and what cases to prosecute? Yes, I absolutely believe so. The police investigate a crime and they, they give a report to the DA's office. It's up to the DA's office to decide what charges are going to be filed. Is it going to be one charge arising out of a criminal incident or is it going to be multiple charges arising out of a criminal incident? And since 97 or so percent of all cases settle in a plea deal situation, the DA in a lot of respects is also in charge of what the sentence is going to look like on the back side because they've entered into a plea agreement. They've made an agreement with the defendant about, hey, if you do this, your punishment is going to be this. And so absolutely, I think that we can lead by example in Payne and Logan counties. I believe I can kick over the rocks and find the funding to make the community partnerships. I, I know because I've done it before. And I'm willing to have those conversations with law enforcement. I'm like, this is what we were going to prioritize. Property crimes, business crimes, crimes against persons. Other things, we're going to find an expedited way for community-based sentencing. All right, Laura? Well, we just cut community-based sentencing's budget, and we're in danger of losing D. Miller. Crimes are investigated and the law officers present them to our office. We don't target certain crimes. We don't ask the police to go target this crime. The police don't decide to target crime. They take crime as they find it. They take victims as they find them. They bring them to our office and I do not and I will not ever say, I don't like that kind of crime. I don't think it should be prosecuted. That's not my job. You've chosen what the crimes are. I have to prosecute them. We have multiple, multiple diversionary programs. Do we need more? Yes. 
Do we have the money to do it? No. Do we use grants? Yes. I have employees on grants. The sheriff's office has tried to get grants. Um, grants are short-term solutions. That is not going to solve the problems we have. We file close to 4,000 different types of cases in the DA's office per year. Misdemeanors, felonies, juvenile delinquent, juvenile deprived, and civil cases, adult protective services, and mental health cases. That's what we do in making up those 4,000 cases. A small percentage of them go to trial. The judges sentence. DAs do not sentence anyone, and the judge is the final person that can say, I'm not going to accept that recommendation, and they have before, because that's solely in the judge's jurisdiction. Thank you. All right, Laura, we're going to start with you on this next question. As the DA, what role do you play with illegal immigrants? Not as many in our county as others. We have had several illegal alien offenders that have committed some crime in our um, communities, and we handle them just like we handle any other offender. I have been asked by criminal defense attorneys before to handle them differently because it might affect what happens to them on whether they're going to stay here or be shipped back. And I can't do that. I cannot do for one party what I would not do for you. I cannot offer someone from another country less than what I would accept and offer to you. So I don't treat them differently. I treat them like any other offender before us, and I do not think they're entitled to be treated differently. I think that's discriminatory, actually, to do that to our community. Thank you. Corey? I think the author may have been asking whether or not uh, we play a role in the immigration process, and, and really, um, Richard, if I understand your your question correctly, um, we don't, and um, that's not really the the role of the purview uh, of the DA. Thank you. Okay, um, let's see. Corey, we're going to start with you on this one. Often, child abuse cases are not taken to court, even when the DNA evidence of a child is willing to testify. Will you be aggressive and pursue litigation in these cases, even when it is difficult to win? Yes, the difficult cases are the ones that you absolutely must win. Um, and the crimes against children, the crimes against women, uh, those are the ones where I want to rededicate our resources to, to where we're actually getting convictions. You know? Child abuse, CF 2014, 741, not guilty. Child abuse, CF 2015, 94, not guilty. These are cases that went to trial. Cruelty animals, not guilty. Kidnapping, not guilty. Rape in the first degree, not guilty. We spend a lot of time pursuing the low-hanging fruit and not enough time dedicating the resources to the crimes that are actually the ones that are worth pursuing. Getting women to tell their story is not anything to be taken lightly, and we need to de dedicate every resource we can uh, to making sure that when they do speak up, uh, we have a successful and efficient prosecution of that. Same with kids. Thank you. Laura? We have a 97% homicide conviction rate a 95% homicide conviction rate. Our conviction rate for all other cases is 97%. So I'm proud of what our offices does. They also may have been convicted of a lower included felony or one count or two count convicted and the jury decides to let them go on a third count. That's what juries do. They're weighing what a um, sentence should be given to an offender and they calculate that by a practical way. We prosecute child offenders. That question's kind of odd because we normally don't get lucky and have DNA evidence in child molestation cases or child rape cases because they happen over time and the child doesn't report right away. Um, we have community uh, multidisciplinary teams that meet weekly to discuss every single case that's come to the attention of DHS and the police involving a child, whether it's abuse, neglect, or sexual assault. We do that weekly. Thank you. 
Laura, this next question is a little bit longer. We're going to start with you. Many young people who commit nonviolent offenses are also victims of abuse and or neglect and have experienced significant trauma. Understanding the responsibility of the Office of the District Attorney to protect the community and provide appropriate legal penalties for offenses, how would you strive to also ensure that these young people receive services to address their trauma, ensure that these young people receive services to address the trauma history, which has also been proven to be a significant, to significantly reduce the likelihood of young person reoffending. Another version of that's going to be in the newspaper okay. with y'all. That y'all had us answer soon. Um, the legislature is responsible for 90% of what's in that question. The legislature has to fund treatment programs and treatment programs that are already in existence. When Texas did criminal justice reform, they put $100 million into treatment programs, 3,000 treatment beds, 2,087 treatment beds in intermediate sanction programs, 3,000 treatment bags in prison, beds in prison, and then multiple release things. The DA, when it comes right down to it, we will offer any treatment facilities and treatment methods the court currently has to use. But my job is to protect the public and advocate the victim who's been victimized by this person. We do a lot of intervention in juvenile court, juvenile deprived, which is the first place you can really intervene that my office has in behaviors that may be per precursor uh, indicators of criminal behavior. That is where we get to interact and work with both families and children to, to hopefully stop that kind of behavior. Outside of that, it's going to take funding and people putting together programs to to offer more services than we have and we would welcome that there's no one that doesn't want more services thank you Corey. yeah i want to go back to something real quick you don't have a 95 percent conviction rate on homicides even a little bit CF 2016 142. I do have. I'm not. He's this. not answering. We're not, we're don't let him do that. CF 2016 562 oh, and CF 2017 531 all ended up in a mistrial or a not guilty let verdict. Him do this when you won't let me respond. Uh, he is making he's not his response. And I tell you, if you've ever gone to like a his, Mabel he's Bassett, he's not answering his question. That's not the question you read to him. And the 97%. It's the same question you read to me. I Most read, all of that. And it is 97 and 95 percent. Most Corey? all of that's at plea. At uh, trial, uh, you have right. a 51.5 percent. We're going to stop the whole thing right here. 51.5 percent. No, no I do not. Trial. Stop. How would you know you've never? All right, we're going to. We're going I to. I pulled every single trial case. So do I. 51 you have the statistics in your office. If you want to brag about going to trial, I suggest we do it better. All right, we are going to closing statements right now. No, ma'am. He has to answer the question. All right, question. Uh, Laura, we're going to go to closing statements right now, and uh, you have two minutes to make a closing statement. We have very real problems in our criminal justice system, even in Payne and Logan County, but they are nowhere near what the, the perception is being portrayed to the public as they are by liberal groups such as the ACLU. We don't incarcerate a lot of people. Why is that? Because we have people in this system that work with them. We have domestic abuse and batterer interventions people. We have inpatient treatment. We have outpatient treatment. We have diversionary truancy programs. These are people that all our partners work on. Our partners are the judges, our counselors, our community sentencing people, our batterers therapists, our Wings of Hope, our Seville Center, we're all partners in this. And that's what we do. To blame something on this system when you fail to legislate it and fund it for 10 years, when all we saw was decrease after decrease after decrease, is not someone that even knows how a district attorney's office should be run or is run. You have to do the work before you lead an office. You have to know what you're doing before you do it. It's just that simple. What I bring is 34 years of experience, and my goal is to concentrate on what the people have mandated I do. That is criminal prosecution 
and advocacy of victims' rights. That is what the district attorney is mandated to do. All right, court, two minutes. The good news about criminal justice reform is it's actually not a liberal progressive agenda. It's pretty balanced on both sides. You know, those liberal Koch brothers are some of the biggest drivers of criminal justice reform. Those liberal states like Texas and Louisiana and Kentucky and Idaho have all had the political backbone to get it done, but we don't seem to here in Oklahoma. 34 years as a prosecutor, that sounds like a primary driver of being number one in incarceration to me. In 10 years, I haven't seen you come down and lobby for a single criminal justice reform. What I have seen is the district attorney's counsel that comes to the Capitol repeatedly asking us for a new fine or a new fee to keep the lights on in the DAC's office. And I've actually heard them say, hey, you can cut us. I know it's a down budget cycle. Go ahead and cut us, but give us the ability to charge this fee. Let us double this fee so that it doesn't really impact us. We have built a criminal justice system predicated upon having more and more and more people in that system just to keep the lights on. And I want to be the DA that stands in the gap and says, no more. If you like the way things are going right now, don't vote for me. If you want to see a new set of eyes on something and somebody who's dedicated to getting his hands dirty and getting in and fixing and solving a problem, I'm your guy. I respectfully ask you to vote on November 6th. On behalf of the Stillwater League of Women Voters, I want to thank the uh, audience here tonight for your participation and your interest. I want to remind you that each of us are um, entitled and uh, privileged to vote. November 6th is right around the corner. You can vote early on November 1 or 2. If you haven't already, go to the library and get your voter guide. It has all the questions uh, with the pros and the cons in here. Thank you and good night. <laughs>